Thank you, Kevin. That was just a wonderful introduction, and it's a great honor to be here. I have not been in colonnades, but my son has, and, um, and I'm very proud of that and all that goes on here at Elon. Um, today I'm talking about showing and telling. Uh, we often hear show, don't tell. Um, but this is an argument for the importance of telling. And I thought I would begin by just uh, giving you a little assignment to hold in your head until the end. You can jot it down or just think it. If you were in my class for the first day, I might ask that you um, think of the following things. A wish that you would make right now a memory that comes to you often, your favorite season, and maybe your favorite toy from childhood. I'll circle back. In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth, light, dark, day, night, land, water, sea, grass, fruit, fish, fowl, good, good, all good. And then he created man and woman, put them in a garden, and told them what not to do and entered the serpent, and a scene begins. There's a lush garden setting and an exchange of dialogue and the great conflict between right and wrong and the suspense, will she or won't she? So do we need all the first part, that exposition, the telling? Well, yes, because all that goodness juxtaposed with Adam and Eve, the serpent, their problem son, Cain, creates all the elements we expect from any good story. Something happens and there are consequences as a result of the happening. E.M. Forster famously said, the king died and then the queen died is a story. The king died and then the queen died of grief is a plot. And by story, he meant the simple narrative of events arranged in a time sequence. This happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. Narrative is what is told, and plot gives it shape. With plot, we begin to understand something greater than what we see on the surface. We see cause and effect, are aware of consequences, and thus experience all the tension and suspense and surprise that a good story has to offer. Once upon a time, long, long ago, one day, one time, in olden days, in ancient times, there was once, once. The singular, specific, once. The whole world over, in every language available, you can find some form of this beginning, this exposition, this traditional storytelling. Likewise, every language attempts to seek resolution, and they lived happily ever after. They lived until they died. Perhaps they are living to this day. The specificity of the telling is the soul of any good story. It's why urban legends always happen in the next town over or to your brother-in-law's cousin. It's why our best jokes often target friends and family or self. The personal connection lends credibility which invites us in for a closer, more intimate look. When is the last time someone leaned into you and said, show me a story? No, tell me a story. Good telling does show. Good telling does incorporate setting and characterization, history and dialogue. But once upon a time, a long time ago, perhaps in a workshop, not unlike your own, someone said, show, don't tell and the words have been misunderstood and misused in many ways ever since. Think of many child narrators you know, and maybe adults who tell a story in a way that leaves you wanting to flee the room. I got up at eight. I had a cup of coffee. I went to work. I had some more coffee. I read the paper. And then finally, maybe about three that afternoon, something happens and the real story begins. I had a professor who referred to this as the toothbrush or the alarm clock story, a kind of warming up to what is important. 
Sometimes you need it to get you where you, the writer, are going, even though you recognize that it isn't a part of the story at all. And other times there's a kind of prelude of telling that is important to the story at hand, what we think of as exposition, an introduction of the place or circumstances that really begin our journey. Think of Munchkinland and the yellow brick road. Think how less vibrant it would be without the juxtaposition of black and white Kansas. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. He was an old man who fished alone in a skiff in the Gulf Stream and he had gone 84 days without taking a fish. In my younger and more vulnerable years, my father gave me some advice that I've turned over in my mind ever since. One of my favorite examples of a beginning is Tilly Olson's opening to Tell Me a Riddle. For 47 years, they had been married. How deep back the stubborn, gnarled roots of the quarrel reach, no one could say. But only now, when tending to the needs of others no longer shackled them together, the roots swelled up visible, split the earth between them, and the tearing shook even to the children long since grown. And with that knowledge, the story begins. Or think about Cinderella. Once upon a time, there was a girl named Cinderella. When she was young, she had a happy life. Then one day, her mother died. Soon after, Cinderella's father married a woman who had two daughters of her own. The stepmother and her daughters were not kind. And then there's a decree. She makes a wish. But where would we be emotionally without the information at the beginning? And likewise, aren't you glad you didn't have to go through the funeral of her mother and then the wedding to the stepmother? That's for Cinderella the novel or Cinderella the miniseries. Good stuff, but the focus of this one is really all about karma and wishing with a pure heart. And of course, if you're reading the Brothers Grimm, there's some pretty harsh justice served up at the end. One great example of telling that never made it into the work that I like to often use in my class is a favorite piece of writing. It's Tennessee Williams' directions for the designer of Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. And I'll just take a minute and, and read it. You're probably familiar with the play or the movie in some form or another, but this is what Williams wrote to the designer. Perhaps the style of the room is not what you would expect in the home of the Delta's biggest cotton planter. It is Victorian with a touch of the Far East. It hasn't changed much since it was occupied by the original owners of the place, Jack Straw and Peter Ocello, a pair of old bachelors who shared this room all their lives together. In other words, the room must evoke some ghosts. It is gently and poetically haunted by a relationship that must have involved a tenderness which was uncommon. This may be irrelevant or unnecessary, but I once saw a reproduction of a faded photograph of the veranda of Robert Louis Stevenson's home on that Samoan island where he spent his last years, and there was a quality of tender light on weathered wood, such as porch furniture made of bamboo and wicker, exposed to tropical suns and tropical rains, which came to mind when I thought about the set for this play bringing also to mind the grace and comfort of light, the reassurance it gives on a late and fair afternoon in summer, the way that no matter what, even dread of death is gently touched and soothed by it. For the set is the background for a play that deals with human extremities of emotion, and it needs that softness behind it. You can imagine all of that being used if, if he had written the novel, there would have been that exposition of the history of this place. Um, the difficult leap to then design a set 
that would bring in the ghost. But that's the kind of telling a student asked earlier today about backstory. And um, we talked about how a lot of times you need to know far more than ever makes it onto the page because what you know of history and all that goes behind a character's life or a situation automatically comes into play as the story goes on. We live here in the South. I won't say it's strictly limited to Southerners, but I think, how many of you grew up in the South? A lot, a lot. So those of you who did not, by now you would have heard someone tell a story kind of like this, or maybe someone in your own family has done it. Uh, I like to pick on my mother, who often um, would call with, uh, should say, oh, you'll never believe what happened to poor Becky Miller. There's the hook. But first now, you remember that um, her daddy was the one, you know, he owned that hardware store that used to be over where, the, where uh, the mall is now. But anyway, way back, he owned his hardware store. It was over there, and um, his hardware store burned down that summer. We were having that awful drought. It was the one time I thought I might get invited to be in the garden club. Everything was looking great. Then it all dried up. The phone never rang. But anyway, everybody thought that maybe his business, you know, maybe he burned it down himself. What with the way that he really had not been right since his wife, not Becky's mama. She died of pancreatic cancer several years before. But the second wife went to visit her uncle over at the VA hospital in Fayetteville, met that pharmaceutical salesman, and was never heard from again. <laughs> My dad spent maybe the last 30 years of his life doing things like this. Um, because inevitably, if you remembered to ask, if you could ever sort of get back on track and say, what did happen? It would be something like, well, she got a flat tire out on the interstate, <laughs> and it took AAA three hours to come. Um, so that's a series of events, you know. Becky's on her car on the interstate, gets a flat tire, takes forever for trip away to get there. It's a story we've all heard many times. You see it, you witness it every day as you're traveling. But what brings, she brought in with all the backstory and the history and the local color and the lore, that's all the kind of stuff, some of it throw away for sure. My dad would say all of it throw away, but, but some of it throw away. Um, but it's also what claims it as something unique to a specific individual. And, uh, you know, for the sake of fiction, you could imagine what might happen if what we knew is that, you know, Becky was, had actually gotten a phone call from that second wife who said, I only have 15 minutes. I'll meet you out on the interstate, and I'll tell you the real story, and this is the one chance. Um, there are all kinds of ways you could spin it. But I like that meandering story method. I like what it brings onto the page. And talking earlier about just writing that first draft, it's a great act of freedom to just let it all blow in and then decide where it goes because it's always surprising what little facts and bits and pieces of detail might indeed be significant to your story. So I'm now going to read you a little essay that I wrote with this whole notion of showing and telling in mind. And um, because my um, son was a student here and loved it, very, very much and has missed it. I, I decided to feature him in this essay. I did get his permission. <laughs> um, it's called Big Little. When my son was eight, he went through a period of time where he was obsessed with death. 
He referred to it as my fear and often had trouble sleeping. My dad had died just before Rob turned two, and so his memories of that time would have been very limited. However, with the desire for my children to know who my dad was, I talked about him often and told stories about their interactions with him. I told Rob how I couldn't keep him away from the hospital bed in my parents' bedroom. If there was a chair beside the bed, he managed to climb up on it and try to pull himself over the bar. Numerous times I caught him babbling away and patting my dad the way he might have the head of a dog, and once I found him all the way up and in the bed. One day, near the end of his life, my dad asked me to lift Rob up into the air. Way up, he said. I want to see his whole body. It was on this same day he directly addressed what was happening, something he had not really done since his diagnosis two months before. He said, I wish that I could be there to watch them grow. When Rob was almost four, he experienced what he called Big Little. I'm not entirely sure what exactly was going on, I just knew that I felt closer to my dad during that time than I had since he was alive because Rob had come home from preschool and told me that he had seen my dad at his school. When questioned, he told me that he came every day when they were on the playground. I said, oh, I would love to see him. And Rob said, I can take you, but I have to drive. I've often thought that his desire to drive me where he wanted me to go is not unlike what we try to do on the page as we shape our visions and images, our stories, in a way we hope will translate for others and have the power to take them there. One night, he called me into his room to tell me that Big Little was happening again. I asked what this meant. And he said, everything is big and everything is little. Worried that something might be going on with his vision, I asked that he close his eyes, relax. Now tell me what you see, I said. And he responded, all I see are grandfathers. I said, you mean like Grandpa David, his grandfather who was still alive? And he said, no, all I see is your daddy. He lay still, his eyes closed, and then he said, Oh, and there you are, Mommy. And he pointed out into the dark room, And you're just a little tiny girl. Sometimes Big Little scared him, and I'll confess it scared me too. But I also found it very comforting, this thought that maybe, in some way, my dad's wish had come true and he indeed was watching. Big Little is now a story I like to tell when people are talking about what I like to call woo-woo experiences, those times when they feel connected with something or someone beyond the realm of their own present lives. And again, isn't this what literature successfully does for us? We see everything unfold on that personal movie screen we have in our minds, the same screen used for childhood make-believe, fantasies and wishes, and by way of that, we also experience it. How many times have you climbed up on that stage to rewind something that just happened? Maybe it was so wonderful, you need to experience it over and over and over again, like playing a favorite song. Or maybe you have the desire to revise it, to see what you wish had happened instead, what might have happened, what could have happened, or here in the South, what might could have happened. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure what accounted for the fear to begin four years post Big Little, it was before his other grandfather died. Rob now tells me he suspects it was from watching one of my favorite movies, What About Bob, and the scene where Bill Murray talks at great length about his fear of death. 
oops. His older sister at that same age had gotten very upset with me for showing the movie American Graffiti. Someone said, file that under chicken shit. My daughter said at age eight that she couldn't believe I would show her a movie with a bad word in it. Obviously, she had been spending way too much time with my mother, <laughs> who if ever asked has quickly told people that they'll never find my books in the Christian bookstore. <laughs> but of course, this was an opinion that blew in and then blew out as quickly as a summer storm, as her wish, just as her wish for those turquoise leopard pants that to my mind never made it out of the closet. And I reminded her of it often when I asked her what I had just heard on the CD she was playing. But whatever kicked the fear into play was vivid and all-powerful. It was not the standard childhood phase that rolled out as quickly as it rolled in. The fear continued and persisted in such a way that it seemed like getting a little help from an outside source would be a good thing. At the time, my son was also obsessed with Pokemon, the Red Sox, boycotting Hebrew school, and shooting basketball, which he would do for hours at the time. There was a freestanding Fisher Price goal in the doctor's office, and I remember sitting in the waiting room and hearing the thump, thump, thump the whole 50 minutes he was in there. On the way home, the talk was mostly about basketball. I heard how many times he got it in and how many times the doctor did not. I like him a lot, he told me, but he's not a very good shot. <laughs> what I learned later, of course, was that a whole lot was being discussed in between shots. For instance, I learned that at one session, when asked what he would wish if given three wishes, his first wish was to live the normal, a normal life plus 100 years. His second wish was that everyone he loved could live a normal life plus 100 years. And his third wish was for a papillon. We already had a big sweet Labrador retriever and a watchful Sheltie, but it seemed in light of the fear that this last wish that could come true maybe should. Where is all of this going? I'm telling a story. And it's connected to the topic I was asked to give, show and tell. I've told the background of a particular time, and now I'll show the outcome. A kid in baggy jeans and Red Sox jersey walks into a pet store where there are a lot of dogs waiting for the right home. There's a ponytailed woman in black stretch pants and a professional looking white smock running the place, and she overhears the boy express a wish for a papillon. The boy and his sister are running from cage to cage, falling in love with first one puppy and then another. The sister loves and wants them all, already thinking of names, but the boy has his heart set on this very particular kind. A papillon, if you don't know, is a teeny tiny thing with great big ears that when up look like a butterfly landed on the head of a chihuahua. I had already called a few breeders only to learn that these delicate creatures, aside from being quite pricey, are more likely to be placed in homes without existing larger dogs and children running in and out all day. There's a papillon, the boy says, and points at a little black fur ball in the corner of a pen. The woman immediately swoops over and informs him that he is exactly right. Not full-blooded, she says, and with her hands on his shoulders, gently pushes the boy closer to the cedar shaving-covered pen, but there is definitely some papillon in there. Everyone over the age of 11, his sister's age, knows that this is not true, but is willing to let imagination and wish fulfillment take over at this point. Wasn't it enough to believe like Dumbo with his feather that he thought allowed him to fly, or Peter Pan with his fairy dust. His name is Buster, the sister says, Buddy Buster, 
named for an earlier dog who had to find a new home because he hated all children except for the two he had lived with. The mother utters the wish that this one will not be a nipper. She writes a check and they go home, and that is the short version story of a boy and his dog. Buster has been determined as a shepu, Shih Tzu and Poodle Blend, and he's a scruffy little 12-pound dust mop who thinks he's much bigger than he is. His ears do not stand up high like a butterfly, but flop down like his beetle-style haircut and Dr. Seuss-looking tail. Still, we call him our Papillon and have for 14 years now. If you came into our house, you would see this elderly little guy with gray goatee and a blue argyle sweater in the winter, curled on a blanket and snoring like a truck driver. He's deaf except for the highest pitched whistles and his vision is fading fast. You would see him there, little old dog sleeping, and I could point and say, there's Buster. Without the telling of his story, you might, he might only serve as part of the setting, a snoring sound effect or comic relief when you touch him and he startles out of a deep, deaf sleep. And in the present moment, he's all of those things. But it's difficult to see just that if you also know that he has the history of getting an eight-year-old boy over the fear of death that kept him awake many, many nights. He's a symbol of long life and wishing good things for those you love. He is that universal wish for immortality. He is a wish that came true. A story told promises to have a life of its own. There's the actual story as it happens, all that we see and hear and witness in a moment, and there's the reverberation and endless reflection that results from the telling and the history of the telling. It's the blend of the concrete and the abstract, the showing and the telling. It's the blend of the big and the little. I can show you, but I have to drive. And there's the real beauty, because we all possess the power to drive. We all have our vehicles of choice. No two trips ever the same. Thank you.